more tough sledding in the CFL in week six, but let's talk about it. Let's see if we can't turn things around here in week seven. What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees. And as I mentioned, welcome to week seven of my weekly CFL football pick show for the 2021 CFL season on the tails of another week where we were just that close, but still underwater. Week six will teach me not to eat my crow until I know it's good and well cooked. I finally said, hey, straight up, we're above 500, and then I go one and three straight up in week six. So that knocks us back underwater uh, straight up. So again, only one and three straight up, one and three against the spread. I did kind of turn the totals around, though. I went three and one, finally hitting three overs. I think that's the second straight week where the over has hit three times in the four games. Maybe some of the scoring finally starting to turn around. One and three, one and three, three and one. It's only five and seven on the week. Another 41.67 percentile week. Now, 11 and 12 straight up and nine and 14, both against the spread and over under. It's only good for barely over 42%. And as somebody that really prides themselves on making strong, capable CFL picks, this is like 15 percentage points lower than where I had hoped and expected to be at this point in the season. So not good. I do, however, at the very least, continue to chug along in CFL fantasy. Boy, we are really moving up the charts here. Eighth place now out of 82 in the official Atlantic Schooners CFL Fantasy Football League, putting in a season best effort in week six, 96.9 fantasy points, 490 points overall on the season on the nose, in fact, and that was highlighted by Michael Riley. 319 pass yards, four touchdowns, did throw an interception, but added 27 yards on four carries, good for 29.5 fantasy points. Also, shout out to Lucky Whitehead. I stacked him with Michael Riley, caught three catches for 82 yards, but added a 119-yard missed field goal return touchdown. Good for 22.7 points overall. Special shout out to him, but Michael Riley gets the MVP for sure. Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. CFL Fantasy roster here in Week 7, and we are rolling with BC Lions yet again. Their offense is sharp. Now, you got to attribute at least some of that to the fact that they played Ottawa their last two straight games, but still. We're stacking Michael Riley with Cooper as well as Kotsoy offensively for the Lions. Kadeem Carey is going to be in there. That is a matchup base against the Ticats, who I think have the second worst run defense in the CFL so far this year. Kyron Moore, because he's Kyron Moore and he's tremendous. And DJ Foster, I realize he's touchdown dependent, but that's a value play. He's really inexpensive. You can get him in there in the flex, and he has a role in this Argos offense from a backup position, but I still think DJ Foster holds almost weak in week out fantasy value a little touchdown dependent but i think he's certainly going to get there once again we're going to roll with no defense it was worth it to stack the higher end offensive talent if things feel a little quicker they certainly are i'm doing something today that i've never done before it's tuesday which means i recorded my nfl show this morning i've never recorded both shows on the same day so we're going to hope that my noggin and my voice holds out for this one. That's why we have some lovely nerd tees just over to our left here. Our week seven slate of games looks like this. We've got Ottawa on the natural bye. Calgary traveling to Hamilton to take on the Ticats. Toronto travels to Saskatchewan. Let's see if the Riders can get back on the happy side of things. BC is in Montreal. And Winnipeg travels to Edmonton to take on the Elks. Let's start with that Calgary-Hamilton game. Calgary moving their record to 2-4 and four last week with a win in Edmonton, doubling them up 32-16. to 16. Bo Levi Mitchell is back. He wasn't on fire. It wasn't a tremendous game for Bo, but it's just nice to kind of see him back out there. I think Jake Mayer still has a part in this offense, and after three straight 300-yard games, I wasn't exactly overjoyed to see that he uh, was not the starter anymore, but... It's always good to see Bo back in there. The Stamps may be back too after a pretty darn convincing win in Edmonton and just proving that those inconsistencies are hanging around for the Elks. This was by far Calgary's best defensive game of the season. They forced 10 punts by the Elks. They got seven sacks defensively, also forcing two fumbles. They won the turnover battle 3-1. to one. 
head and shoulders Calgary's best defensive game. Special shout out to the guy that led the way in that, Stefan Banks on the defensive line, eight defensive tackles, as well as four quarterback sacks all on his own, and he recovered one of those forced fumbles. Calgary got into penalty trouble again in that game. They took 12 for 110 yards overall. That's not going to fly most weeks, and it's also not going to fly with Kadeem Carey only getting 11 carries of the football for 45 yards. I think he rebounds, but man, this pass game is monstrous, and it's mostly Kamar Jordan and Markeith Ambles. They combined for 31 targets, 17 catches, 214 yards through the air, and I believe a, a Markeith Ambles touchdown. Ticats record dropped to two and three on the season with a sig single point loss, sorry, in Toronto against the Argos 17 to 16, a game in which they lost another starting quarterback. Dane Evans suffering a hip injury. They had a baffling mixed extra point. You gotta wonder where the voodoo doll is against the Ticats. David Watford enters the game, the QB3 for the Ticats. He completed 60% of his passes, was only good for 78 yards in relief. Now with Evans, he's going to be out four to six weeks. So now the question becomes, is Jeremiah Masoli ready? If he's not ready, can Watford carry the load for one week or two weeks until Masoli is back and ready to play again? We don't really know the answers to these questions. I believe Masoli is practicing, but I don't necessarily know if he's practicing full-time with the starters, if he's going to be ready to go. It's a question mark for sure. Ticats were down 14 points early in that game, which meant their offense became very predictable. You're not going to win a lot of games in the CFL if you have a predictable offense. Being down 14 points, they only ran the ball twice in the first half. Sean Thomas Erlington only touching the ball six times. It's predictability. You can pin your ears back as a defense. You know what the other side is going to do. Hamilton cannot fall into a predictability trap or it's going to be a long day. The unfortunate uncertainty of the quarterback situation in Hamilton just means I can't I can't take them, especially as a betting favorite, which they are in this game. I just don't think Hamilton's got the juice to win this game in particular. I think Calgary's a little bit on the incline here. If they're going to make a push in the West Division, they got to start doing it now. Not a game that Calgary can afford to lose. I'm going to be on the stamps here in Hamilton to beat the Ticats. It's not just the quarterback situation. I look at Calgary. They're a team that has at least a slight statistical advantage in a lot of categories here as a team. Points per game, total offensive yards, time of possession. They just have certain edges over Hamilton that I think put them in a position to succeed in this game. On the line, Hamilton is laying three and a half points as a home favorite. Completely understand that, but certainly taking the points on the Stampeders here. Like them to win outright. Even if I didn't, I would be happy to hedge this either way. It's not a great hedge, but I'm all about taking the points on the better team. So we're going to go ahead and take the three and a half points on Calgary. Total in the game set at 41 and a half. Pretty solid lean on the over on this one. It's not going to fly over, I don't think, but this is a number that I do definitely think goes over. Most of the public does. The team money leaders on covers definitely think this goes over to the tune of like 78%. So we're going to go over 41 and a half points in Calgary Hamilton. Let's go Stamps 23, Tie Cats 20. Let's go to Saskatchewan now, battle of the three and two teams as the Argos are in town, coming off of that aforementioned 17 to 16 win at home against Hamilton. I'm still not convinced the Argos have an offensive identity. They won the game, but they still only scored 17 points to do it. Now, the defense obviously had to play well in order for that to happen, but again, offensively, Nick Arbuckle got the start. He was average. He had 62% of his completed passes, only threw for 236, had a passing touchdown, had a rushing touchdown, and nine yards on six carries, did throw two interceptions. He still has not convinced me that he's the QB1 on this team. And I, if he's convinced anybody else, I don't know what games you're watching. Uh, John White did lead the backfield, 12 carries for 84 yards rushing, but DJ Foster sniped a receiving touchdown. So again, who is the more valuable back? It took a Ticats missed extra point, 
Uh, 35 minutes plus time of possession, which fantastic job by the Argos to possess the ball that much. Uh, a quarterback injury on the other side and several real crippling penalties for Toronto to win this game by a single point. And once again, that's a credit to their defense because Hamilton had kind of been rolling offensively here for a few weeks. The defense registers four quarterback sacks as well as an interception. So the defense played very well and they got the win. But again, I'm not thoroughly convinced of this team yet. Oh, how the mighty have fallen in Saskatchewan. This was a team that just a couple of weeks ago was undefeated and was starting to look like a bit of the class of the league. Now, all of a sudden, they lost back-to-back -back games to the class of the league in Winnipeg. They sit at 3-2. and two. They only scored 17 points combined in those two football games, coming off of a 33-9 loss in the Banjo Bowl in Winnipeg. Riders got their lunch served to them on back-to-back -back games, and Cody Fajardo got injured. Now, on the plus side, William Powell did outduel Andrew Harris in that game last week, which is one of the things that you have to do to beat Winnipeg. Powell touched the ball 21 times, had 121 all-purpose yards. Harris touched the ball 19 times, only had 87 all-purpose yards. So Powell, definitely the more valuable back there, but that was about all that went right for Saskatchewan. This was a close game at the half. It was a three-point game, 12-9. to And then a 21-0 run for Winnipeg in the second half. And that's it. I want to take a second to shout out wide receiver Kyan Schaefer-Baker. Seven catches for 73 receiving yards. Inarguably his best game as a professional in the CFL. So we wanted to shout out Kyan there for an extra extra good game they took 12 penalties for 143 penalty yards including nine for a buck 13 on defense now a lot of that came in the scuffle and obviously a lot of people are talking about the scuffle that happened in that game a lot of people saying look andrew harris deserved to be kicked out of that game as well for ripping the helmet off that guy i 100 percent agree but I think even if Andrew Harris would have been kicked out of the game, because it's not like Andrew Harris was game-breaking in that game last week. Kick Andrew Harris out of the game, I still think Winnipeg wins that game in a walk. So there's a lot more things that Saskatchewan needs to clean up, not the least of which being their protection of their quarterback. So Fajardo gets a minor concussion, looks like he's going to play, but they allowed him to get sacked four times in that game. They only registered one sack with their defensive line. That's the kind of thing that in combination with the penalties, especially on the defense, doesn't really deserve to win. There's no way the Riders stay this bad, right? Like, this is just the fact that they're snake-bitten against Winnipeg. Right? I am going to take the Riders to win this game. It's in Saskatchewan. They are 3-1 and one at home so far this year. And once again, Fajardo practiced today and practiced with the ones. So it looks like he's going to start. There is a significant difference between Cody Fajardo and Isaac Harker. So if Fajardo can't start... And Harker starts, I kind of like Toronto, but it looks like Fajardo's going to start, so I'm going to go with that. It's a risky play. Given that I think Fajardo's going to start, I like on the line Saskia's laying three and a half points at home. It, it's buying that extra half point, which I don't love doing, but it's like it's, it's so weird because you look at this. If you got this line and looked at this line in the preseason and said, hey, week seven, Saskia's going to play host to Toronto, they're only going to have to lay three and a half points. That would feel like a dream. That would feel like a great line. And now in week seven, it's kind of gross. But the Argos are only one and two against the spread away from home. So it's not like they're world beaters on the road. I'm going to lay the three and a half points with the Riders. Total in the game set at 42 and a half, which is a real middling number, except in the context of this CFL season. And the public and the money leaders on covers anyway are kind of split on this one. But the money leaders are leading 63% to the under. I think I'm going to stick under on this one. I think it's the Riders defense that comes up big and exploits the fact that this Argos offense Again, sort of struggling with its identity, at least as far as I'm concerned. I think the Riders' defense gets it done. We are going to stick under on 42.5 points in Saski, Toronto. Let's go Riders 23, Argos 17. And at this point, for the second time today, of course, I would like to take the opportunity to shout out my great friends and sponsors. We'll pull them over into the screen now at Nerd Tees. My second cup today of Amaretto Almond Biscotti, a classic blend for me. NerdTees.ca, 
promo code BWFINEST is going to save you 15% at checkout. You're going to get free shipping in Canada on any order over 100 bucks. Or if you're one of my viewers from south of the 49th parallel, you get a great conversion rate on the US dollar. I just love I just love the smell of this amaretto almond biscotti. It makes you feel like you're having a classy alcoholic drink, but you're just having a delightful cup of tea. Nerdtees.ca BW Finest is that promo code. Save you 15%. Get your free shipping. Find yourself something to love or find someone you love something to love. You can do it at nerdtees.ca. Let's go to Montreal now where the Alouettes, fresh off of their bye week, are going to play host to the BC Lions. All of a sudden, one of the hottest teams in the CFL. Lions winners of two straight absolutely dominating the Red Blacks last week, 45-13, to 13. and in a game like that, what doesn't go right? They outran them, they outthrew them, the Lions were better in every single facet of that football game, offensively, defensively, special teams, there was no part of that game that the Lions didn't dominate. Mike Riley was surgical, 85% completions, 319 yards, four touchdowns and a pick like I mentioned before, three different touchdown receivers. So once again, classic Mike Riley spreading the ball around. Brian Burnham with a pair of receiving touchdowns. What else is new? Javon Kotoy found his way into the end zone. And shout out to Keon Hatcher, a rookie in this league, scoring his first CFL touchdown, had a really decorated career in college, bounced around a little bit in the NFL. A rookie here in the CFL picks up his first career score. Shout out to him. But it wasn't just the offense getting in on the scoring, of course. As I mentioned before, Lucky White had a 119-yard missed field goal return for a touchdown. Massive for him. I had him on my fantasy team. Ah, felt so good. He had a touchdown. Bola Combo had a pick six, a 20-yarder, I think. So the defense was scoring. Special teams was scoring. You clean up the turnovers. They had three turnovers in the game. Still won the turnover battle 5-3. to three. But you clean up those turnovers, it's pretty well a perfect game. Alouettes, meanwhile, coming off of their bye, are also coming off an absolute demolition of the Ottawa Red Blacks, 51-29 back in Week 5. Again, only naturally, the Owls offense absolutely clobbering a hapless Red Blacks defense for 34 minutes in time of possession. How bad did they clobber them? They only punted once. Vernon Adams completes 78% of his passes, 288 yards, four touchdowns, did not throw a pick in that game, added 35 yards rushing on seven carries. What I think was his best game in 2021, arguably one of his best, if not his best games as a pro in this league. Eugene Lewis and Jake Wynicke combining for 12 catches, 238 yards, and all four of Vernon Adams' passing touchdowns. Far more important than the offensive numbers is the underlying attitude and the underlying methods. And that is the Owls took no penalties on offense. Zero. A big fat zero. This team struggles so much with penalties. For no penalties on offense is a massive accomplishment. They took six for 74 total in the game. Their last two games, only 14 penalties for 160 yards. That is a marked improvement for the Alouettes. It's exactly what I've been preaching to them for about a year and a half now. So maybe they're finally starting to listen. Obviously, these two offenses are tremendous. But if you look at the offenses as a push... Which I think you can make the argument. I think BC has a better quarterback. I think the Owls arguably have a better receiving core. I like the Owls running back situation a bit better. If you look at their offenses as a push, you got to lean on the more talented defense and the hotter defense. That's got to be the BC Lions, even though, again, their last two games have been against Ottawa, which is a hapless offense. I still think this Lions team has a better defense then the uh, Alouettes, the Alouettes have struggled a little bit defensively. I got to lean on the hotter defense. I'm going to take the Lions here in Montreal to beat the Alouettes. I think the Lions have found a level of consistency that the Alouettes are still searching for this year. Also worth pointing out, BC has not lost to a team in the East Division yet this year. They are 2-0. and oh. I think that continues through Week 7. On the line, this game is a pick -em. It's a pick em between the Owls and the Lions. Obviously, I like the Lions to win. No further explanation needed. I'll take BC as a pick em. Total in the game set at 48 and a half. That's a CFL total. There we go. That's the first total this year, I think, that actually looks like a CFL total. 
Uh, in saying that, I'm going to stay under on it. Um, the, there's a slight consensus to the over in this one, and I can totally understand why that's the case. These are two really good offenses coming off of really good offensive games, respectively. But I think maybe we should walk before we run a little bit here. And I think BC's defense becomes the difference in this football game. I don't think it stays under by a lot, but uh, especially with the way this season has gone, I, I can't take it over here. So we're going to stay under 48 and a half points in BC Montreal. Let's go Lions 27, Alouettes 20. And the final game of the week, we are looking at the Winnipeg Blue Bombers at five and one winners of three straight games traveling to Edmonton to take on the two and three Elks. Winnipeg coming off of that dominant performance in the Banjo Bowl, 33-9 to over Saskatchewan. Again, the Sean McGuire show. Sean McGuire has been unstoppable these last two weeks. Saskatchewan generating almost no pass rush in that game whatsoever. Zach Kalaros had plenty of time to sit behind his line and absolutely dissect the Riders' defense. You had Nick Dembski with five catches for a buck 34 through the air. Kenny Lawler, five catches, 97 yards, and a touchdown. You had uh, Adams who had uh, three catches for 49 yards and a touchdown, Darvin Adams. So he just made use of the weapons that he does have there. And the weapons that he has, I think I might have been underrating a little bit this year and probably underrating Kolaros himself. Bombers were absolute monsters on second down, 13.2 yards per play. And it's not like, oh, they only had uh, a small number of second downs. No, they had 20 second down plays in that game and averaged 13.2 yards per play. They were dominant on second down all night long. Adam Big Hill on the defensive side, leading the way with six tackles, a sack, an interception. He was all over the field. Willie Jefferson, three tackles, two quarterback sacks on Cody Fajardo, as well as one of those forced fumbles. Offensively and defensively, this team's a juggernaut. They're just a juggernaut. For the Edmonton Elks, I mentioned it earlier in this episode. It's this, and then it's this, and then it's this, and then it's this. Uh, Edmonton dropping to 2-3 and three on the season, getting doubled up by the Stampeders last week, 32-16. to 16, And it's back to the same old problems. It's inconsistency on offense. It begins with the quarterback. It's not limited to the quarterback. And it is the lack of involvement. Where's my drum? Let me beat the drum. The lack of involvement of James Wilder Jr., Make it make sense to me. James Wilder touched the ball 13 times, had 74 all-purpose yards. He accounted for 24.3% of the Elks' offensive yards in this game. Maybe give him the ball more than 13 times. Any game from here on out, let, may, I'll, let's save us all some time. Any game from here on out where James Wilder is healthy and doesn't touch the ball 20 times, just insert this clip. Just assume that this is the way that I feel, unless I tell you differently. I, it doesn't make any sense. It would be like the Tennessee Titans not giving the ball to Derrick Henry. I understand. The, 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 look, look, he's not Derrick Henry even in the CFL context, but he's they're so dependent on him offensively, or they should be because he's the one that gets results. Edmonton converted just two first downs in the entire fourth quarter. Two first downs after that pick six in a game that they were trailing. Fait accompli. The Elks are 0-3 at home, which means they are probably due, just maybe not against Winnipeg. So we're definitely going to be on the Bombers in this one. Let's take Winnipeg in Edmonton to beat the Elks. Winnipeg is 3-0 and versus the West, even though Edmonton has won both of their games against West Division opponents. Consistency here is king. Winnipeg's got it. Edmonton very much does not. On the line, the Bombers are laying 6.5 points as a road favorite. Edmonton is not only winless at home straight up, they have not covered against the spread at home. They're also 0-3. However, all three of those games... They've been favorites. In one case, I think they were a heavy favorite, like by more than a touchdown. Again, they've only been favorites. And this season, as underdogs, the Elks are 2-0 and against the spread. I think this is too many points. Again, if any team in the league is going to cover this number, it's going to be Winnipeg. But I think this is a competitive, tight, low-scoring football game. 
I just think six and a half points is too many. I'm going to take the points with the Elks. I don't think that's going to be a popular play, but I'm going to take the points. Total in the game here is set at 41 and a half points, really split between the public and team money leaders. But these two teams are only a combined three and eight to the over this year. That Winnipeg defense can be dominant. Edmonton has shown that they can play better defense now than we could have said earlier in the season. I think I got to stay under on this. It's only by a couple of points. It's going to be tight. It's going to be a sweat, but I'm going to take under 41 and a half points in Winnipeg, Edmonton. Let's go Bombers 23, Elks 17. Take the points with Edmonton. All right, there you have it, folks. Those are my week seven picks in the CFL. Going to go over them here with you one more time. I've got Calgary upsetting Hamilton in Hamilton. We're going to take the three and a half points with the Stampeders in a game that goes over 41 and a half points. I like Saskatchewan to beat Toronto at Mosaic Stadium, and I'm laying the three and a half points on the favored Riders in a game that stays under 42 and a half points. I like the Lions to go into Montreal and beat the Alouettes, taking the Lions as a pick 'em in that game in a game that stays under 48 and a half. And I like the Winnipeg Blue Bombers to go to Edmonton and beat the Elks, move the Elks to 0 and 4 in their own building. But I am taking the points with Edmonton plus six and a half in a game that stays under 41 and a half points. The week seven episode is now in the books. I survived recording both episodes in the same day. My voice survived. Thank you very much to, again, my friends and sponsors at Nerd Tees. They really got me through this one. In what is a shortened CFL season that we're very quickly approaching the middle of, the turnaround's got to start now. If not now, when? So here's hoping we're going to, whatever you pray to, here's hoping the turnaround begins now. That's it for me, Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees. Enjoy the week seven games, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you again in week eight, when at least Ottawa will be playing again and something will make sense.